It is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Chung to the second session of the Canadian Liver Foundation's Live Right Health Forum, Ask the Expert series. As someone who has had a liver transplant or is waiting for one, this can be an exceptionally scary time. Dr. Chung will be talking about liver transplantation, the surgery, recovery, and the quality of life. Dr. Chung is one of the most well-respected liver transplant surgeons, both academically and clinically. He is a full professor of surgery at the University of British Columbia and has made incredible contributions to the scientific community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Chung. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Chung. Liver transplantation has become a well-recognized option for people living with liver failure. In Canada, over 400 such operations are performed each year. So Dr. Chung, what are the most common reasons for liver transplantation and is there an age limit? Uh, so the most common uh, cause for transplantation has previously been a hepatitis C but uh, with advances in um, research for hepatitis C, uh, supported by the Canadian Liver Foundation in part, uh, hepatitis C has almost been cured. Um, so the, um, the numbers of patients that we have had to transplant for hepatitis C have been declining, fortunately. Unfortunately, other liver diseases have started to take its place. And um, one of the main causes of transplantation now uh, are metabolic causes, um, something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, whereby fat, uh, fatty infiltrates uh, go into the liver and cause uh, destruction of the liver cells, but also um, liver cell cancer, specifically mm -hmm. hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are rapidly taking over um, uh, as the most common causes for liver transplantation. Okay. And is there an age limit to get uh, transplanted? So. That's a common question that we're asked, is, is there an upper age limit? The answer is no. Um, we tend to look more at physiological age rather than chronological age. Um, there are, especially in British Columbia, as it turns out, there are very healthy 60, 70, and even 80-year-old uh, people. Uh, so we tend not to look at absolute age. It's, of course, a consideration because the older you are, um, the more physiological um, uh, problems that you might have. But if someone is uh, otherwise, apart from their liver disease, perfectly healthy, we would have no hesitation in thinking about transplanting someone in their early, uh, early 70s. Uh, I think once we're getting up into the mid to late 70s, the ability to withstand the stresses of a transplant become a little bit, uh, a little bit more challenging. Absolutely. Thank you. And then the next question is, where do donated livers come from, typically? So uh, the most uh, common um, uh, common source, if you will, of, um, of uh, donated organs uh, come from individuals who have uh, unfortunately had an event which has caused an irreversible brain injury. Um, this might include something like um, um, a stroke or some sort of head injury from a motor vehicle accident or, or a fall or uh, some event which may have caused uh, lack of blood supply to the brain. Um, sadly, something like a, the opioid uh, overdose crisis um, has, um, has been um, a cause for um, brain injury. And um, there's a silver lining to every, every, uh, every unfortunate incident, I suppose. But uh, so these have been, these poor individuals have actually been, um, uh, their families have been willing to offer their uh, organs for transplantation. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, um, generally speaking, how long is the wait list to get a transplant and how does the wait list work? I don't think it's, uh, that's a very complex question. I don't think we can say in terms of just pure time how long someone would be on, um, on the wait list. It's a, it's a series of considerations that we take into account. Um, you could be on the wait list for one day and be transplanted. Uh, alternatively, you could be on the transplant list for many months, even more than a year, and not receive a transplant. So how is that possible? Uh, so the first thing we look at is blood group. So we try to match uh, individuals blood group to blood group. 
if we don't do that, there is a significant risk of losing the organ uh, for um, graft rejection. Uh, the second, and probably actually probably the most important, is how ill is the person on the wait list. So we tend to um, we tend to uh, we tend to triage uh, people by how ill they are with the most sick patients uh, being moved to the top of the list. Unfortunately, that does, uh, that does cause some people who've been on the list longer to drift down a little bit. But we feel that's the most, um, most important thing is to try to give the organ, which is not a very common, uh, not a very common event, uh, um, we give the organ uh, to an individual who's the sickest and uh, is most likely to die the quickest. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's a minor consideration, but still something we take into account is the size. So something has to fit. Um, so those are the, I think there, there are other considerations, but those are the, the major ones. How many hours is a liver transplant surgery usually? And how successful is a transplant these days? So liver transplantation is probably one of the most complicated um, procedures that's done in the surgical, uh, surgical field. Um, but again, like anything else, there are some which are, uh, I hesitate to use the word uh, easy, uh, but there are some which are easier and some which are more complex. Uh, I would say uh, a transplant can range anywhere from four hours uh, to over 12 hours, again, depending upon the complexity. Success rate, we would expect that, um, that at one year, 90% uh, of the people that we transplant should be alive and well. So wow. it's pretty good. It's really great stats. Yeah. Yes, especially when you consider that without a transplant, um, those people are unlikely mm -hmm. to survive more, you know, a, a year or so. Absolutely. Okay. And sort of following that, um, what are the possible risks and complications of a transplant surgery? Uh, so the surgery itself, as I mentioned, is one of the more uh, complicated procedures we do. Um, the people that we are transplanting tend to be quite ill because of their liver disease. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, age isn't necessarily a, um, a reason why we wouldn't transplant people, but the older you get, the more, uh, more likely it is that there are some other issues, maybe some heart issues or some lung issues. Uh, so there are those problems. Mm -hmm. um, then there are the technical issues. Uh, a lot of people requiring transplantation have something called portal hypertension and that's when the uh, pressure inside the uh, abdomen of the blood vessels is much higher than in normal people. So the pressure inside the blood vessels builds up and these blood vessels inside the organ are, are, or inside the abdomen are very thin, like they're, they're thinner than, than paper. So they're at much higher risk of, of rupturing. Uh, so bleeding is one of the main complications. So we have to take the diseased liver out and put the new liver in, which requires a number of uh, reconnections to um, have the organ functioning properly. So any one of these connections can have problems either with leakage or scarring. Um, and, um, and the operation takes quite a long time. So we also worry about infections. Uh, uh, either inside the abdomen or, um, or, uh, or in, in the lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's quite a complex operation requiring many people to try to get people through the operation well. Absolutely. Great. So this is a question from somebody in the public. Um, so they state, I'm listed for a, tra a liver transplant. How should I prepare for it? Well, like anything else, I think keeping yourself as healthy as possible is the, the straightforward and simple answer. There's nothing specifically that I would say, like there's no magic drug or magic diet that you should take. Uh, I would say that try to keep as active as possible to maintain you know, muscle tone, maintain, um, maintain your uh, lung capacity. Uh, and there's no better way uh, to do that than by, if you can, I know it's sometimes very difficult, but to move around, you know, maybe if you can go out for a walk, uh, if you cannot get outside the house and just move around, move around the house, uh, eat proper nutrition, um, processed foods and fast foods, not specific to liver transplant, but in general are not the best for health. Uh, so I think you have to watch your diet very carefully and um, just uh, maintain, uh, maintain uh, uh, as much ac activity as you can. I think the worst thing to do would be to uh, lie around, uh, stay on the couch or stay in bed and uh, take out fast food uh, for your nutrition.
Thank you. Very good advice for everybody, <laughs> probably in the room. Okay. Next question is, how much pain is typical after a transplant surgery? How large is the scar? And how long typically is the recovery period? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the incision is, um, is actually relatively large. Uh, you can imagine trying to get the liver out and putting the new liver in. Uh, we can't do the so-called keyhole surgery uh, technique, so the incision is quite large. It usually goes um, the full length of um, uh, maybe under the right side of your rib cage, and then maybe there's a, another smaller component that goes up towards the breastbone. Um, but despite the fact that it's a relatively large incision, um, it doesn't—it's not—it doesn't seem to be as painful as uh, as I would have expected it to be. Um, uh, maybe it's just uh, because people psychologically are so happy to have a new liver, they're focusing on on getting better, and maybe the discomfort from the incision doesn't seem to be as uh, as, as 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 important as, um, or they're not focused on it as much as I would have thought. Uh, generally, the recovery depends on. On, uh, on an individual, uh, um, how, how ill are they when they're coming into the transplant? If they're really ill and they need to have uh, rehabilitation in terms of um, getting their muscle strength back or getting their lung capacity back, it can take, it can take uh, several weeks to get out of hospital. Other people who seem to have the liver problems as their only, um, only problem, they can be out of hospital as quickly as um, uh, seven to 10 days. I would say the average you should expect to be in hospital maybe about uh, 10 days to two weeks, but many people are out of hospital sooner. Uh, but unfortunately, um, people who might be weaker coming to the transplant might have to stay a bit longer for some rehabilitation. And of course, if a complication were to, were to happen, which it does happen, um, then it would depend upon how quickly we can uh, recover the uh, individual from that particular complication. Speaking of complications, um, what happens when a liver, a new liver, is being rejected, and what are the signs of organ rejection to watch out for? Uh, interestingly, rejection doesn't really give a lot of symptoms. We generally diagnose uh, rejection by blood tests. So when um, someone comes in for a transplant, they get uh, daily blood work, and we look at the liver enzymes. Normally, the liver enzymes are fairly high after the transplant. Uh, but then we would expect them to fall uh, fairly quickly uh, back to normal range within, you know, maybe a week or two. Uh, if the liver enzymes go up after, you know, after a period where they've uh, been coming down, we start to look for reasons why that's happening. And the most common cause for increasing liver enzymes is rejection. But generally, um, an individual who's experiencing rejection will be pretty pretty much they won't know what's, they won't notice. It's uh, more of a blood test and uh, a biochemical uh, pickup. If it's really late rejection or if it's really severe rejection, they may start to have fever and just general feeling of unwellness. Okay, and usually how frequent is the medical follow-up care after a transplant and for how long in their life do patients need to continue receiving follow-up care? So uh, obviously, um, the immediate time frame after the transplant is the most important, and that's why people have to stay in hospital initially. But once, um, once an individual is ready to go home, and we don't send people home until we think that they can go home, um, they follow quite closely in the post-transplant clinic, usually at least uh, twice a week, um, with uh, quite frequent blood work. Um, and then as you get further out from the time of your transplant and you're feeling better, uh, the numbers of visits to the clinic uh, becomes less, so it might go from two times a week down to once a week to once every other week and then once a month and so on. The frequency of the blood work also uh, declines, but here's the important thing, uh, you have to be followed basically forever. Now you don't necessarily have to come, you know, some people have been transplanted five or ten years ago, they don't necessarily have to come into the clinic uh, every every three to six months, they might just come in once a year even, uh, but they do have regular blood work. Uh, they don't necessarily have to come in to see us, but we do expect them to have blood work on a regular basis. Okay, great, thank you. The next question is, what are the outcomes of liver transplantation, and what can I expect my quality of life to be after the transplant? Can I return to work? How physically active can I be? So our objective with a transplant is not to replace one problem, such as your underlying liver disease, 
with another problem, which is you've been transplanted and now you have to take some anti-rejection medications. That's not the objective. The objective is to um, have an individual return to their uh, lives um, as they were before the onset of their liver disease. So if you were healthy and working before the onset of your liver disease, we would expect you to be able to go back to work after you've had your transplant. Um, if you were um, an athlete uh, doing marathons, yeah, sure, that's a reasonable expectation for you to be able to go back to doing that. Um, you know, but uh, we do recognize there are some people who may be more sedentary and uh, have had a lot of other issues build up um, during their period of illness, so that's not going to happen overnight. Um, it may take, uh, may take um, months to years to rehabilitate uh, after transplant, but the expectation is to get someone back to what they were doing before their illness uh, started. So this is similar along the same lines question. How long will my new liver last and what should I do to keep it healthy? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, again, our expectation is that someone should be able to uh, fulfill whatever, whatever their normal life expectancy was supposed to be. I mean, obviously nobody has a crystal ball to know how long one's life expectancy is, but we would expect someone to be able to get at least close to uh, their normal life expectancy. Um, obviously, uh, there are some issues associated with transplant that um, someone who hasn't had a transplant uh, wouldn't have to experience, like you're taking a lot of medications which are necessary uh, to preserve the liver, uh, but some of these drugs can cause difficulties with high, with high blood pressure and uh, cholesterol issues and, and, and sugar abnormalities. So these have to be watched very carefully. The most important thing uh, to preserve the health of your liver um, is to uh, follow up with your physicians. Uh, they're monitoring your blood work, they're monitoring your blood pressure, your blood sugars, your uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, so you have to follow up very carefully with your physicians and take your medications. Now, um, again, people feel very well after their transplant, so they feel, well, I'm feeling, I'm feeling so well, why do I need to take these medications? That would be a, a very poor decision if you stop taking your medications. And then again, just general advice uh, for anyone, regardless of whether they've had a transplant or not, stay active, eat well, um, and you know, don't do anything illegal. <laughs> Good advice. The next one is, um, we know that living donor donation is now an option. How does it work? What are the risks of being a living liver donor? How much do they take from your liver? And does donating part of your liver shorten your lifespan? Mm, yes. Uh, so the reason why uh, living donors started in the first place was because of the insufficient numbers of um, organ donors, which we talked about earlier, um, that would come from deceased individuals. So living donation for transplantation came up as a, as a way to try to increase the number of organs available for transplant. Uh, so um, the process is that the person, the person who is un undergoing a liver transplant have to, has to have the same reasons for undergoing transplant as if they were receiving a donor from the uh, brain dead donor. Uh, the next thing is that they have to have um, a healthy donor. It used to be someone that um, had to be related to the uh, potential recipient, but that's no longer the case. It could be someone who's uh, emotionally related. Uh, so a friend, you know, like a, a, well, um, a fellow worker, and under very, very rare circumstances, um, a so-called anonymous donor. I just mentioned that for completeness sake only. So then the donor has to undergo um, a series of tests to ensure that they are medically fit. Um, they can't really have any major medical problems because um, our, our goal at this point is to maintain uh, the health and well-being of the donor. We don't want to do anything that would uh, cause problems with a potential donor. And then, of course, blood group. Um, if uh, the blood group match is inappropriate, then, um, then that can't happen. So we look for appropriate blood group matching and we look for appropriate um, medical health for the donor. Um, the amount of liver that the donor would have to give basically has to be sufficient to keep the recipient alive. So the larger 
the potential recipient the larger amount of liver one has to give. In general, okay, not always, but in general, that would amount to about half of an individual's liver. And, um, you know, uh, the, the great designer of human bodies uh, made it so that um, they must have foreseen transplantation as a possibility. So, they, so we have way more liver volume than we actually need. And uh, we can survive on as little as uh, a quarter of our liver. Obviously, we don't want to take out three quarters of someone's liver. We like to leave some, some uh, uh, margin of er for error. Uh, so about half of the liver is required. Uh, obviously, if, uh, if uh, the individual is smaller, then they would require a smaller amount of liver. Uh, if someone is larger, they need a larger amount of liver. Um, unfortunately, that means that if a potential donor is too small, and uh, we wouldn't be able to take out sufficient liver for a potential recipient, or if a potential donor is too large and we can't fit the liver in, uh, then that uh, would be an exclusion as well. So it's quite a complex process. Um, living donors have, it's, it's a relatively new, well, by relatively new, I'm talking 20 years, uh, but, the, but over that 20 year time frame, it does not appear as though there's been any decrease in life expectancy uh, for uh, living donors. It's really good news. Yes, it is. So I think we have time for one last question, mm -hmm. and a very relevant now, given the state of affairs of the world. So this one is, what about specialist appointments that have been put on hold due to COVID? What should we expect for regular transplant clinic visits? Are surgeries being resumed? Are liver transplants still happening? So I guess, how has COVID shaped the world of liver transplantation? Well, like, like uh, every other facet of our life, uh, COVID has affected uh, liver transplantation as well. And it's not a cliche to say it's a, it's a, a new world and we have to adapt. Um, but many of these adaptations are actually, I think, for the better. Um, if you need to be seen, you will be seen. Okay? There's no question about that. Uh, however, um, there, we understand that there are maybe risks of, uh, for an individual coming into a hospital. Uh, so we take care to assess each individual to determine whether um, the physicians and the rest of the transplant team, do we actually need to see the individual? If not, we can do telemedicine. Um, and so we can assess the patient over over um, over Zoom or whatever or whatever other um, uh, platform you're using, and if under those circumstances we detect uh, some concern, we will ask uh, the patient to come in and see them in person. Um, during the initial COVID uh, pandemic, unfortunately, transplant programs were um, the numbers of transplants we did declined dramatically. But um, over the last um, month or two, the numbers have, um, have started to come back up to where they were previously. Uh, so I think we're, we're back to the normal rate um, after a bit of a lull during the initial COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. Um, but um, as we get used to dealing with the new circumstances, um, we've been able to adapt as well and get the transplant rates back up to where they were before the COVID pandemic. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure.